Okay, do you? Uh, welcome everyone to the second half of the Ardesh. Um, to start, Ruan, um, can I ask you to introduce yourself, your background in research and republicanism and your main areas of academic focus? Well, well thanks for that. Thanks for having me here, by the way. It's great to be here. Lots of friendly faces here, which is great. Uh, I'm, my name is Ruan, and uh, so I have the most unpronounced my name in Ireland, and I say something. It's, it's pre Christian, so it's bloody old, and it's close to translation would be blood mist. So that's, if I have to choose my pronouns, I'm going to be Mr. Blood Mist, <laughs> or maybe Dr. Blood Mist. One day, Professor Blood Mist. <laughs> oh, yes, I have a, I'm aiming high, right? But the fact that I haven't promoted me in 14 years, 18 years, so I don't think that's in life anytime soon. Um, my, I'm an O'Donnell, and I'm an old school O'Donnell. My grandfather was in the IRA in Derry. We're done with all Derry O'Donnells and bars. So when our country was sundered by an act of um, British Parliament, so called, uh, they couldn't stay there. So they got parked my grant for the O'Donnells for the first time in thousands of years out of Ulster in Dublin, where we had no connections whatsoever. My great grandfather was a ship worker, which meant he had to go where the contracts were. He was driven out of Harlem Wolf at least once, maybe more than that. So suffice to say that it's a peripatetic lifestyle. Now, I wasn't aware of that until I was older. My grandfather told me all these stories and they had a deeper effect than I realised. It was going into my psyche, but he never told my father. My father didn't know about my, his own father's side of background in the Civil War and the truce and before that. And being that he was a slow commander of Derry. So, in 1981, um, when I was 13, I was extremely energised and um, angered by um, the hunger strike in Belfast. I don't, I, I, embarrassingly, I don't have any specific memory of the 1980 hunger strike, which obviously I, I, I knew about, but that didn't seem to get the same sort of traction as anyone wanted. And from that moment onwards, I was reading Irish history with a different sort of, a different pair of eyes. And I became very interested in the ideology and the history of the public movement. And I became very um, aware that we had unfinished business in the northern part of our country. So that, as my teenage years developed, that led to me becoming, I suppose, a, a supporter of um, Republican programs, if, if, if that explains it. In later life, I realised I could I could do a research into these things, which is not something I thought about. I went to college with a view to becoming a teacher, and not having to emigrate to somewhere I didn't want to go. Um, things played out slightly differently. I ended up having a family quite young, which gave me a bit of a bit of a, a responsibility that I had to sort of uh, get a job basically. So. I followed on a research master's on the United Irishman with um, a research PhD, a full, you know, full, full PhD, 300, over 300,000 words on the transportation of Irish political prisoners to Australia. That necessitated living in Australia, and in that whole time I was um, continuing my broad education. So these days I, I, I've sort of taken a decision. I'm only, I'm only going to write about the case of the public movement, but, but in, all its, in all its varieties. Um, Avran Don, can I ask you the same question? Um, obviously, most of the people here know you, but there's some younger um, members in Irish now. Um, if you could tell your background and yeah. Uh, it's not a similar to what Brian has described there as well. Uh, I was born in Ahigan, which I made from Ireland back in 1957. Uh, one of the people who lived in our house at home back down, down the islands, as it was called then, was my grandfather. He lived, he lived with us, he lived with my mother and my dad and the rest of us. Uh, and my grandfather, he had been involved in the ARB and the volunteers back after the volunteers were formed. Indeed, the had the Allen Company would have been the original company down that whole area of the garden quarter town. Uh, he was one of the one of the people who mobilized on Easter Monday uh, to go to Colain. Uh, only to find out about the Cancer Mountain or Easter Sunday, only to find out about the Cancer Mountain orders. Uh led to a lot of confusion. It was Monday before they realised that the raising plan ahead was planned in Dublin. Uh, he was active through that whole period. Uh, at the time of the treaty, he served down along the border uh, under Frank Egan. Uh, after Egan had captured the Dark Forest from the 
from the Free Steers. Uh, my grandma was one of those family or thirty who would end up in the Pilly Magnus because it didn't see the sense of moving on the barracks, but it could be surrounded. <laughs> um, within a, a week or two of Fagan uh, having occupied the barracks, the Free States had surrounded the barracks, captured the Egg and 100 plus prisoners. Uh, not so long afterwards, there was an attempt made, a successful attempt made to blow the wall of uh, the log barracks. Uh, I think it was 113 men in total or, or got, got out and not escaped. Far in excess of what they expected. My grandma was one of those who had uh, been assigned to be a cover, cover and fire during the escape. Uh, um, even when he was telling me these stories, this is, I was growing up as a child, you know, I guess I was almost like a keystone cop film. If anybody remembers that, about black and white keystone cop films. Uh, they had enough jars, as my grandma said, she had very few people in the company had jars in them. <laughs> uh, a lot of men were taken on bicycles, where you had two and three men on a bicycle trying to get away. <laughs> as well as men uh, getting away, trying to get away on foot. Now, a lot of them were recaptured very, very short, shortly afterwards, within hours. But there was a substantial amount of them did get away completely. Uh, my granda was in the 1920s, uh, the mid 1920s, simply because the situation in the six counties were probably being a nationalist and a Catholic was enough to get the job discrimination, being a Republican, uh, not that they had no chance of any employment. And uh, he emigrated to Canada for a while. Now, the intention had been that he would take the rest of the family out to Canada and then start making new life. The same as many Republicans did at that time, a lot of people who went to the States and things like that. But he couldn't resist the call of home, so he said less. Less than nine months, right about eight and a half months, nine months he stayed in Togo. And came back, uh, he was involved in the 1940s campaign, him and my mother both were both active Republicans. And you know, bear in mind that my granddad that age, she got my side in the 1940s. They were running about my age, she went in the 60s at that stage. You know, then uh, my mother would have been in her 20s. Uh, and again, not a high, a high gallon area, it was an area where the ARA in the 1940s had a, a, a training camp. I don't know what it is to believe that there was training camps in the north, but there was because down, lot, down around the high gallon area, that whole lot near sh shore, shoreline, a lot of bog, you know, plenty of places that they have uh, camps at. To hide. <laughs> and to hide. And the, and the other fact that you yeah, had, you know, a lot of, depending on the time of the year, a lot of people, they used to have a lot of shooting going on, believe it or not, but then go on the left shore where you get ways out, way fed, fed and whatnot. So, a few people had enough parents from a revolver, parents from a rifle, wouldn't have made much difference at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, he became enchanted with a movement. Uh, Disenchanted by the movement, I should say, following the Stephen Hayes affair, when you had the allegations that the, the, the Red Chief of Staff of the ARA was an informer. Um, it actually led to a, a lot of disenchantment with a, a, a lot of ARA personnel in different parts of the country. Now, the ARA was not a big organisation in the 1940s, but where you had a situation where the Chief of Staff of your organisation is uh, suspected of being in the forum. Uh, Puts question marks over many things that, that have happened here in that period. Uh, I was born, as I said, in 57. Went to school in Merton. But by that stage, I was only a, a child, literally a child in arms when we moved from my grand into Merton. Uh, still kept up that those visits out, out, out around the Agalan area on a regular basis. Uh, 
Jesus och ställde. Han samma på sig när han skulle ta ifrån. Eh, klara av slag. Det här med att det är bjärs och fjärs, men inte så stigna in. Det är bara det starta det celebrationsmöjlan. Det är det starta det backlash i hans celebrationsmöjlan. Det är det som är så. Sen Pauls primary skate har startat, jag tror att det var 1969 när jag startade, sen Pauls har det varit 1961. Jag var lucky där också, för att det var en del av de här fläktorna som jag hade, men jag såg att det var smutt med en brand med Arby Brand, och jag såg att det var en del av de här fläktorna. Jag har alltid varit grann upp med det här stället som jag hade från min brandfar. Jeg har mer fra min brannfar enn jeg har hatt fra min mor og min kjempeste. Og meg selv og andre var det bare noen som var på det stedet, like just as young lads, hvor Seamus Farber og Brandt hadde en liten løp med litt for drop down og røy med Harry's og sånt, og det var en relasjon til selv og rett skjent igjen. Vi var noen som var på en volunteer for det, det var han bare. Then I moved on, you know, 1970, and then in with internment. Yeah, internment, you know, the Russian internment right trial. And, you know, people from the Oregon area, the, the, the mass of the would have carried out at that stage. And you were talking, you know, the uh, North Oregon there, Chilokee, the Oregon Ferry, were going to school in the morning. The like, like a Lord and Carrie would have probably be saved off by the way we're doing a house to house, a house search about a state with two, two, three hundred houses on it. You know, and that, that went on all day long, and maybe in the second day in some cases. So it's a kind of uh, background that I was growing up on, yeah. you know, and he couldn't but help not say what was happening on the streets, you know. I couldn't say it was happening around it, it was happening to your neighbours. Uh, um, the uh, impact was there, but eventually within a, in a few years, I think by 1974, <coughs> 73, 74, when I uh, joined the Fianna Iron, and then I uh, stayed with the Republican movement in various shapes and forms for the rest, yeah. you know. Um, and you're talking about in the 70s there, um, like becoming active in the Republican struggle. Where do you, and um, where did the Republican principles of the United Irishmen or events like 1798, 1803 and 1916 fit into people's thinking at the time, do you think? Like, did you just think about that? Did you just talk about that at the time? Well, I suppose there's a couple of different aspects to that, you know. One is, and if you had a lot of this goes back to my grandfather and having that history now. My grandfather was a great man for this from the RTE, the radio, right? Radio Rare. And every night uh, he would sit and listen to different programs. And I haven't been slept in the same room, so they had no option but to listen to it for the time. <laughs> but the benefit of that was, as if he would give his opinions, and if they said something, he would turn around to me correctly or it, you know. So I almost had a history going up in the room beside me, and I was getting that history and didn't realise it. Because, you know, RTE, some of the history programmes in RTE, to be fair to were quite good on, on, on the radio. Some of the talks that you heard at that time. And obviously, my brother could give the local land of you know, but, you know, within us for itself, you know, whether, whether it was like the Krakens or anything like that. Uh, so, you had all that context going on, specifically uh, about the United Irishmen. Well, again, from my grandfather, I had no idea about the connections, the local connections to the United Irish men out around the United Yalm area because the Lake of Buff's Tone and the Krakens and whatnot is a, actually a passage in 
wat van ons daar heb ik de helpen reis op de spaan bij het na ik 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 ben de dierpark ik de zee brown zee en dat is een heel helpen reis daar voor een half jaar en als je denkt kijk je nou dan moest de vader daar zeer vanaf hier ja te go for a chat with our families mm-hmm. for a couple of days but they wouldn't be getting so bad by the British or anybody else in different spies and whatnot the British system had but they felt safe enough to go out to the deer park obviously this was just a couple of days before he went to America so obviously they were fine with this but they were looking both telling me to achieve from America in terms of support and families and their own, own plans as to how they would operate in, in his absence, you know, and again, you know, the fact that that was happening just up the road, a few miles from where I was born, you know, it's history and, it's relatable. you know, it's something that's impacted on you, even if it, when I was growing up, you know, uh, again, the teachers that we had at school, they were never taught. Irish history was never a formal subject of primary school. And it wasn't a formal subject of the secondary school. You had history, but you had teachers who would have focused on Irish history. Mm. And again, you know, while it was a primary school, but uh, Bernadette McChadna, uh, Patsy McMahon, and again, Patsy was a man who would become involved in the civil rights movement. Alf Murray, he was a former president of the GAA. You know, they were very flexible and I had had like, their staff, their teaching staff from as a primary school going up in the 60s. They teach as long as their kids could read and write, the teachers could teach them anything else they wanted. <laughs> you know, so there was a lot of leeway given and they used to have these, these talks, you know, about being an Irishman. Even about 1916 and all the rest of it, but you wouldn't hear tell it. Uh, you know, at school nowadays. But the, t- the teaching staff, whether it was us, they themselves, or from that nationalist or Republican background, were very open and doing that with their classes. Mm. You know, it was never part of the formal curriculum. Yeah. And likewise, the same at the uh, secondary school. Not all the teachers, but certainly a number of the teachers have had the same at all, you know. They just had an interest in They had an interest and they were passing that yeah. along. So you're picking up. This has to be up all the time, you know, whether it was <coughs> informally through school or informally through a grandfather, you know. Yeah, good man. Uh, everyone, mm. you've written on various aspects of the Irish Republican struggle, yep. stretching from the United Irish Men in the 1790s through to, the, through to experience of Republican prisoners of war in the 1990s. Can you tell us a bit about how you got first into interested in Irish republicanism and maybe give us a quick overview of the political ideas that motivated the United Irishmen. Well that's four or five very good questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Well growing up in the 70s you, you were, I was aware that there was a war in the north and that sometimes had uh, impact in this jurisdiction. Uh, I, I grew up um, first of all Renan and then volunteer and volunteer had a very and the whole great Mark Farnham area had a very strong cadre of um, IRA support networks. So we had a lot of black flags, a lot of um, graffiti, uh, political taste for graffiti, and all of the fucking nonsense that goes on these days. <laughs> and uh, people's names, for Christ's sake, no, Jesus, what's that one about? I don't know. But uh, I, I remember the time, I, I remember, I remember, my mother was very, very good to me in the sense that um, she always bought me history books and books. I mean, we went to the library every week. So we went to Carnegie, Carnegie Library in Dunham every single week, and I'd get two or three books a week, and I used to buy a lot of books I'd just spend my money on. And I'll tell you, I just got for heavy metal, so it was a bit divide between heavy metal and books. <laughs> and I now got books on heavy metal, so it's a great divide. Yeah, obviously, phenomenal, you know what I mean? And uh, I remember reading The Wolf Union Men with Robert Key. Now, Robert Key's not a great historian, he's an Englishman of Irish extraction, but he's doing his best, and it's not a bad entree point for 14 15, right? I read John Mitchell's Jail Journal. My mother brought me John Mitchell's Jail Journal. Is it any wonder I ended up writing this type of stuff? Well, I just have a rough day like Go there. Uh, you say for a first communion. A <laughs> <laughs> uh, first communion, you know what my friend was from Uncle Mike? John Tracy and the therapy. 
Well, I had, a, I had a similar, you know, you and I from different jurisdictions in the same country, a very similar upbringing. So I've been festooned with Republican propaganda and memoirs. I read about Wolf Tone and then I was buying stuff on it. And I was there, although I was in military history, by the way. I was talking about both my grandfathers didn't finish secondary school. They, they were one to join her, the other was a, a tree cutting company. So they were less school in their early teens and done training, right? But they're both very, very well read in military history. And that got me into this. And then I began to apply military history to Irish history which we tend not to do. We're never encouraged to do Irish military history. I wonder why. <laughs> I wonder why. And uh, warfare, asymmetrical warfare, uh, guerrilla tactics, uh, illegal technology, this is the bastion of all those things. And our people are doing things 200 years ago that no one was doing, and have ever since. It's, it's a quite extraordinary. But the Irish Times won't tell you that, and RT certainly won't tell you that, and they won't let me on to tell you about it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been fired for a couple of years for taking on Woodrow the Edwards. Now, if you want me to debate on live and air and MI5 agent, I will. But I mean, you expect me to say what I'm going to say based on empirical evidence. And if that person can't keep up, too bad. Mm -hmm. But apparently, uh, you know, the, the establishment had to go there. So I read a lot about it. It's interested in it. Turns out I, I then discovered that at several, several other members of my family, both sides of my family, were involved in the, in the, in the war for independence. And then um, and my wife's family were steeped in it also. She's got several um, significant IRA ancestors, including some very leading figures. Donald Booker is a great grandfather, for instance. So it, be it began to accumulate and make more sense that when I could write about the rebellion in Wicklow, the second most violent county in Ireland, never, there's never been an analytical account of it, unbelievably. Um, 14,000 Wicklow Irishmen in 1797, by the way, 14,000, right? And they, they fought very vigorously until um, October, November 1798. And in guerrilla style until December 18, uh, 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 three with Michael Dwyer and, and Hughes and others. So this became something that uh, I realised we don't know this. And if I go to the archive and I look at things people can't be bothered looking at and do it diligently for year after year after year, and I go to London and look <laughs> at <laughs> British, yeah, I went to London and look at British military records, other campaigns in Ireland, including those things that had never been cited by the Irish historian. It's hard to believe. I actually am the first person to ever utilise the logs of the ships that carried the United Irishmen to Australia. No one ever, I'm the first person. You know what I mean? I'm 54, and no one, they've been there for decades and decades, and no one touched them, right? The original in London, and the microfiche is in Australia, right? And I mean, you realise what you can do. So that's why I, I, I realised, I could sort of save us for myself a bit. So I started with the United Irish, which is a good starting point, because they believed in things that I believed, which are still unfortunately current. They believe that we have a right for self determination, we have a right to republican democracy. We have a right to separate church and state, and whilst religion may be very useful for many people, it's not the business of the state. We do not want monarchy, which is inherently corrupt and evil. We're not imperialists, we're anti-imperialists. Uh, everything chimed with me as a young person. I haven't moved one iota from that sort of ideological belief system. There's nothing um, Wolf Tone or Thomas Addis Emmett or Robert Emmett ever said that I would demure from, or William Drennan for that matter. Now, Drennan sort of pulled back a bit, but he does some very heavy lifting in the early days. When you look at that transplantation of the Belfast Presbyterian radicals, particularly then in the early days, then more important, Simon Nielsen, who was almost never spoken about, who came here to Dublin to work in the, in the nexus of this thing of ours, uh, they were very, very important people. Uh, Tone helped define it. You have the co foundation of the United Irishmen, as you know, on October, November 1791. And Tone knew very early on you, we have to break the connection with England. Because you cannot have a self determining independent republic. Of progressive politics and equality and citizenship alongside a, a, a parasitical monarchy and imperial state that is, that is unfortunately the, 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 uh, the bane of the ordinary Britons to suffer under, under, under their various French and German overlords, supported by their oligarchs, yeah, kept in permanent poverty and still regarded as subjects, no separation of church and state, all the sectarian nonsense which they fought for half to half the globe and more. Uh, the justification for uh, ex uh, expropriation of other people's nations and wealth. These are not things that will sit with the Irish psyche. We, we have our own history, we have our own ancient history, with the, with the oldest language in Western Europe, with the oldest system of codified law. The precepts of Breton law are still the cutting edge of modern jurisprudence. A lot of jurisprudence is caught up what we had uh, centuries and centuries ago. And we, we survived despite all of these things, and perhaps we were hardened because of our oppression. And uh, the, the continuity principle of we, we never accept a defeat is very important. Our people were never defeated. At times they were contained and restrained and held back and killed and exported and starved. All these things happened, but we were never defeated. And we never can be defeated. This is why the importance of the Fenian iconography of the Phoenix uh, were indestructible and invincible. Because we're right. We're right. The things we are arguing are, are inherently sensible and just. 
and modern and current, right? How can that be wrong? And they, but the problem with this is those who can fight on behalf of the masses should. It's that citizenship. If you can, you should. If you can't, that's fine. We'll do our best to help you out, right? And this is where, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't want to sound trite by quoting and paraphrasing someone like a titan like Bobby Sands, but everyone can do this. Everyone who wants to be involved in some way can, can, can contribute. And we have, some of us must contribute until we find. We reunite our country and we bring Republican democracy to all of us. So this is something that an um, exercise needs to be tell, right? I, 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 can't be, I can't be calm about this. But when I, the more research I do into it, and I, I like, I'm very empirical, I like going to the sources, and I do that um, as often as I can. I do as many interviews that people know what they're talking about as I can these days. You find that there's a bigger story. That the existing literature, the historiography, specifically in terms of my own field, is inadequate. There's a lot more to be said. Now sometimes it's not said because it's not legally prudent. And they've made sure that's not legally prudent to say certain things. And that's okay. There's some things that perhaps should not be said. There's many, many things that can be said. And my, my dear hope is that all of us can do the best we can to say the things that can be said. Because if they are in defence of the Republican idea, they cannot be wrong. You kind of answered my next question, but I'll still read it out a little bit mm. because you might go into it a little bit more. Um, I have the United Irish Men were founded predominantly by middle class of non-conforming religious traditions. How was it then at a time when all, almost all aspects of Irish life were controlled by Protestant beliefs, a group of well-to-do radicals came to the fore in advocating for rights of Catholics? Kind of, if they could do it, so they don't. Do you want me to ask that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, in a nutshell, without giving you a mini lecture, which I'm about to do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Until 1778, right? 3% of the Irish population control 100% of the politics. And if you control the politics, you therefore control the economy and you, you control the nature of the state or the state. And they were the landed members of the Church of Ireland. They weren't even the Church of Ireland, who were less than 10% of the population, were incredibly influential. These are people, the primary beneficiaries, beneficiaries of the plantations. Um, the old English, the, the earlier migrations of um, uh, earlier, I suppose, earlier peoples moving here, they've been subsumed into the body politic uh, over time by intermarriage, by settlement, by development, and the normal course of life. But the 3% who were originally landed, landed Protestants, and that's what they call themselves, and they are sometimes described as Anglo-Irish, but I don't like that term because they're, they're not any less Irish than I am. I mean, you know what I mean? It's, it's really a nonsensical term. They're not Anglo anyway. There's no Anglo-Saxons in Britain. There's a handful of them on the coast, you know, near, near the continent, and that's it. They're not a Saxon country. There's, there's no Saxons there. They're, they're a much different migration experience than ourselves. They controlled everything under the, not just penal legislation, but also legislation that restricted um, not the home process. So Presbyterians, um, Society of Friends Quakers, Methodists, and Ireland was one of the leading areas of producing Methodists. The first Methodists that went to America or Australia were Irish. Um, Penn, Penn spent a lot of time in Ireland. Right? We had a significant history with non commercial powers in this country because they could get on here. Uh, also the Huguenot tradition, there's others out there, and down in Limerick you have the Palatine people too, German, German Protestants who were brought into parts of Limerick. Some of them, like Morgan Yeagers, ended up in the IRB in Australia. I mean, you can imagine called Morgan, Morgan Yeagers and being an IRB man. He was, right? I, I, you know, I rest my case, Your Honour, right? <laughs> so it, people were motivated to something about this. The population of Ireland was one to three that of the rest of what they would call later the United Kingdom of Britain and Ireland. So we were a substantial population base until the war to war, until 1845, when we were decimated. And we'll never recover from that. There's no coming back from that. We're a different country, we're permanent because of this. There were some advantages. The, the, uh, the emigrated populations became very useful as an engine of finance, organisation, and propaganda for the, for the movement at home. So the, there, there, there's some silver linings to this, but it's not, this is not how you want to go about such matters. The United Irishman, Wolf Tom, of course, uh, a slightly religious man. And the late 18th century was useful for Republicans because there was a breakdown in religiosity. There was a lot of intermarriage. People were being buried during those graveyards. People were, were conducting their lives as normal people should do. It, it became much more religious in the 19th century. Because you had basically a Protestant evangelical revival and then you had a Roman Catholic, you had the Romanization of the Irish Church in, in the 19th century. That wasn't there in the 18th century. Very little of it, right? So people like Thomas Russell, not more Protestant, tone, very liberal, the, the, the Presbyterian radicals who were quite advanced, polemical newspaper writers, 
pamphlet, pamphleteers um, switched on. And if you read the, if you read any newspaper from the 1780s, 1790s, maybe the 1770s, and they normally came out three to four months a week. There'd be a column on what's happening in our talking shop in College Street here in, in Britain Street. There'd be a column on what's happening in the Imperial Palace of Westminster. And that's what they called it, and that's what it was meant to be, the Imperial Palace of Westminster, right? There'd be a column on what's happening in Paris and what's happening in Philadelphia. And that's in every single newspaper. So we, the people who were literate and was increasingly literate had got four newspapers, which were increasingly cheap, and the pamphlets that were emanated from that sort of structure, you were, were very well informed, which is why which is why we knew all about the issues of taxation without representation, all about um, supporting a foreign army in your country in the 13 colonies. We were very conversant with these issues. Everyone would have known who Talleyrand was, and maybe who Napoleon was. You know, they were, they were more well informed than, than you might imagine. So when it came to issues of connectivity, you, you, you could, people went to Paris. You think of Tone. Tone attended College Green here. He went to their College Green in Westminster. He went to Philadelphia. He went to the French National Assembly. He attended the, the Dutch proceedings uh, in, in Holland. This man, in, in, in one short lifetime, met and interacted with people in five or six countries at national level on behalf of Ireland as the military plenipotentiary of the United Irishman. And in his absence, great, great, often included figures like Thomas Adams Emmett, who was the chair of the Constitutional Subcommittee of the United Irishman, they were drafting precepts that were very modern and are encapsulated in the Proclamation of 1803, which I personally believe it was heavily influenced by Addis Emmett, and, and of course, therefore, his, his brother, Robert Emmett, who read it in Thomas Street. Equal constituencies, paid uh, salaried uh, members of parliament, um, the demography reflecting the vote, universal male suffrage, uh, uh, separation of church and state, uh, regional representation. These are things that are very modern and, and are still pertinent. And they were doing this at a time when nothing like that existed in Britain, right? Unfortunately, um, and this is where this is where I'll have to cut this short. Advocating a radical solution like that went from being dangerous to seditious with the British attack on the French Republic. So from 1792, arguing for reform, radical reform, uh, in, in, in the absence of environment. Remember, whilst the electorate was creeping up, with, with certain property Catholics being allowed to vote after 1778, it made no damn difference. But you're still going to the same talking shop, which is subjected to a diktat from Westminster anyway. So how far are you going to go? Are they, and, and when it became likely that they couldn't run Ireland correctly, they abolished the bloody parliament. And took a lesser number of those people across the border, and that's why you starved to death in your millions in 1840s, you know national government. Mm -hmm. the, even an existential threat to our people, is, is, is the guards' belief. So that was an issue that did have the possibility of French alliance. The French were serious about it. They regarded as Abdel Jalalis. He was two successful Atlantic revolutions, one in America, aided by the French and the Irish, one in France. Um, the, the great defender of the French uh, early battles of the Republic was a man from Dublin, De Jennings, who won the Battle of Valley in Jamaat. We, we knew about these things. He's not a general kill name, this is Don de Guerre. Uh, Napoleon was very pro-Irish when he came to authority. You had the Irish Brigades, which were the only one, only foreign legion allowed to carry the, the, the French, the Republican uh, Imperial Eagle during the Pagan phase. You have this sense of ideology, right? They're not mercenaries, are our allies. Uh, they did come in 98. They were going to come in 1803. It didn't work out. It was not unreasonable thing to imagine a successful revolution in the early, uh, late 1790s, early 1800s. And they were going to make everyone's life better. Um, did they succeed? No, it did not. Did those ideals get extinguished? No, they've never been extinguished, and they can't be. Um, Everend Anne, I know in recent years you've done a lot of research on the Orange Order and sectarian murders in North Armagh and surrounding areas. It can be argued that non-conforming Protestants, who also suffered significant, significant oppression during penal times, bear to the Republican ideal in Ireland. Why do you think that was the case, and how was it that the same Protestant community went on to become the reaction and secretariatism in Ulster? I think is a very tough and sum of that. The ownership of the land in Ireland was the end of, end of the 19th the century. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, and 
That's the case end of the foundation of the orange order. Now, on one hand, you had that 3% who owned the land. It's ruin referred to. County Armagh was one of the most populated counties at that time, in the, uh, in the 1780s, 1780s. Uh, so there was a lot of competition, even regarding tenant holdings on the land. Uh, you had, I think it was in the 1770s and 1780s, you had to take that like, where the two, the two performers, not the kind of performers, but the yeah, reflex, yeah, you're right. To, to the two reflex, which extended actually rights to Catholics, to Presbyterians, to Methodists. Uh, but the Church of Ireland was still the main body of which a lot of the most almost all I would say every one probably of the major land owners uh, along to uh, those acts that give some relief to, to the minority religions and to Catholicism actually assisted and Catholic families say in North Armagh being able to access, uh, and part of this came from the Industrial Re Revolution as well, you know, the introduction of weaving rooms in the homes so people weren't fully dependent on their small home to be able to pay for their rent at the end of the year or longer. Right. So that started, uh, I'm not saying that started it, but it, what happened was you had this animosity growing between Protestants in the North Armagh, mid, mid North Armagh, and Catholics over land and land homes. Now that was exacerbated by the fact that a couple of the major landowners in Armagh included the Burners over towards the Ganset and the Blackers in Port of Iron. And let's not forget Lord Sharon and Dublin the Black, you know. And they encouraged, they literally encouraged this division between Catholic and Protestant in Armagh. In contrast, in Antrim and Down, it was those minority religions within Protestantism, the Presbyterians, that's where the Presbyterians were strongest, Presbyterians and the, and the Methodists were, were far, far stronger. No, the Church of Ireland did not have the same grip over the people, and therefore people were, were less answerable to what they were being told by, by their <coughs> Protestant landlords, people about the Church of Ireland. And that's one of the reasons why you had that more openness of discussion and contact between Catholicism and them, the, the, those other minority Protestants, for want of a better term, religions. Uh, but between the end of the 1800s and the 19, um, mid 1890s, you had this conflict start the arrays in, in North Armada. It was encouraged by the landlords, encouraged by the burners, the blackers, <coughs> the and all And like, you know, these people, we're not talking about a landlord who owned three or four thousand acres of land, we're talking people who owned 20,000 acres of land. Right, right, you know. Own every Huge. plot of ground that was yeah. grown in the county of Armagh and her own. Uh, they encouraged this, this fight and this struggle, you know, this competition. Um, the fact that the Catholic minority were no longer dependent upon, because of the economic changes that, that were happening at the time. No, the looms in the house where you didn't have to go and farm without a land, what you needed to, the land was, was was for your own house, it wasn't what you didn't have to go and farm for, for black iron lands. You know, because you were getting your alternative income from the work that you did and the income that you made from your soul so your own. You know. So that all had an impact and it led to the clashes actively encouraged for over ten years, you know. Like culminated and what's been called the Battle of Damon in seventeen seventy five, you know, 
the bottle is luckily over in the space of half an hour. Uh, but that in itself torn led to the formation of the orange order and they made it off their mouth. But it's worth pointing out that seeing that those that decade prior to the foundation of the, of the Orange Order, somewhere in the nation about 10,000 plus Catholics were expelled from their homes in the North Armagh area. Now that's a substantial section of anybody's population if you go on county to county. And a lot of them had to flee the other parts of Ireland. Some as far, made it as far across to Mayo. And the aid of the dead, you'll hear reference of the Earl Burn Mayo, Mayo to the Ulties. Mm. And that comes back from the Ult the Talks. You know, people who were forced from their homes in the 1780s, 1790s, and they were asked to go but as far away as possible. And there's actually a tie in that comes out of that, this, the 1790s as well. But the Orange Order was fine, right? Because it was the landlords could see the regular burners and others, those who were in the could see. You had Catholics and Protestants starting to get together in Belfast and other areas. As they started getting as serious as Rowan said, you know, they could become a potential threat to the government of the country. So they needed to stoke this religious animosity up in somewhere. Started it in Arab. Uh, the order was founded. The Orange Order was founded in 1795. It was armed from the right outside. You know, it was not this friendly organisation that wanted to make peace with everybody. It was armed from the right outside. Mm -hmm. It was armed by the landlord classes. It was armed by the, by, by, by the government. And it was used uh, to create even more trouble and other parts of the north, in the north at that time. Uh, the militia units, many of the, the militia units, very literally set orange men, sang into uniform overnight, mm. you know. Uh, and some of those were used right across Ireland to, to, to put down 1798 rebellion. Uh, but it's worth looking again at, at that whole thing about that connection. What would have happened if you hadn't had landlords like the Blackers and others conspiring amongst themselves to create the circumstances that would allow the government to uh, move in and start introducing all sorts of repressive measures? Because Two years before the 1798 rebellion, you had, what was his name, Chamber and Lake, and it was an Ulster. And Bart had upon a two year wave of repression, two years before 1798, right across the whole of Ulster, all nine counties, a wave of repression aimed at trying to wipe out the United Irish movement even before that got to the stage of getting ready for the rebellion. You know, so the British were always using the Orange Order on that mainstream Church of Ireland Anglican, Anglican religion as the bulwark against any chance of a rebellion. And we're using it at every twist and turn. And at every time since then, you know, whether it's, whether it's the Orange Order or whether it's unionism in any shape or form, any time there was any sense of uh, we need a bit of help here, you know, whether it was maintaining conservative governments in the, in the present day or maintaining the government of the day in the 1880s, 1880s, or 1890s, right through till prior to the beginning of the, the, the First World War. Let's go right to the Irish forces in the north. You know, let's create a crisis. Let's provoke something. And we know we'll get the reaction that we may not be want from the other side, and we can just move in and plump down everything. You know, that was almost a bit. They were 
Kantara in Yeshan. That force of what was the common unionism, loyalism, back in those days, you know, back in the Saturday and eighties, as a as a as a kind of revolutionary force, which it has always played in the day. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I just want to amplify what Grandon's um, very forcefully laid out there. He's completely right. I, I, my, my suspicion is that the Iron Door was conceived in Dublin Castle by the Under Secretary of State for Civil Affairs in conjunction with the Military Department. And people like Edward Cook, who ran the Secret Service, were in and around the formation of the order. Uh, Captain um, Gifford from Dund Dundrum Castle was present in and around the Diamond, the then locality. So was Fry from Roscommon and Sligo, big landowners from Roscommon and Sligo. And they represent the deep state ultra conservative element. Um, and they were worried that there had been a. Uh, into the 70, in the mid 1790s, there was, there was a possible chance there was going to be Catholic emancipation. It won't put, what Ernest Fritz William was recalling, I think it was God, 75, 75, 95, it was obvious that there was going to be no concession of Catholic emancipation, which would have had to go along with the emancipation of non conformist Protestants as well, which is what happened in, in 1828, 1829. Uh, the non conformists first, then the Catholics, right? That, that would have solved a lot of problems. But, it's, but having gone for the nuclear option, we're, we're not holding that. Armagh probably had the most religiously diverse, pop strong population in any county in Ireland, right? Wicklow has a, was a third Church of Ireland, but I said the nine, nine counties of Ulster, Armagh was the most divided and unstable. It's also very strategic. The whole uh, Armagh Toronto sector is very strategic, right? It always was. And Enniskillen was a very important town in those days. Partition killed part of it. Partition destroyed Enniskillen. It should be a major city, it should be another Limerick, it should be another Galway, but it is now it's, it's, it's a struggling town, right? Increasing nationalists, incidentally. The uh, Orange Orb itself was emphatically Church of Ireland. And one of the things that changed after 98 was Presbyterians were encouraged and allowed to join the Orange Order. Part of that they might consider respectable. And you wouldn't have a Methodist about the place. They're called, you know, their, their clergy were called swapping creatures. And there's, these, there's open sectarian views between the Protestant sects, right? They're also allowed to join in much greater numbers to Freemasons. Now, I sound like I have a tinfoil hat on, but uh, <laughs> I, I maybe sometimes I need one. But suffice to say, the, the, the role of Freemasonry is not insignificant. Until about 1800, most Masons in Ireland were Catholic, including Daniel O'Connor, right? They're mostly Catholic. Uh, it, then it became emphatically the William White Right and heavily Protestant Pres Presbyterian. That's been changed in more recent times because they're doing a bit of a come and join us type situation. I, I haven't been asked, I'm not expecting <laughs> the letter of the post anytime soon. So, you know what I mean? <laughs> you, you might be in already, but don't tell me. I want you to compromise your position. Suffice to say that uh, the, the Presbyterians have fought in 98. They're the ones that had their leases fall in and were not renewed. So you have a second wave of outward migration from Antrim and Down of the wrong sort of Presbyterian. And the good sort were let into the, into the parlour now. Oh, we like you now. Stop, you've got that out of your system. Stop all that panning around with those mad rough Catholics. They're 80% of the population. They're, they're in league with the French. They're going to bring in the French disease, in other words, democracy. Uh, that won't do you any good, but you, here's a step up for you in the economy and in, in, in socialist status, right? So we love you after all. We're going to recognize your marriages, which we didn't before, which meant you couldn't leave property to your children. We're going to, we're going to you know, re recover from that situation, making you the enemy, because we need you now. And we need you to control Belfast, Mid Ulster, and Dublin, right? and Cork. And remember, it wasn't until the Local Government Act of 1900, right, but it came into effect in 1900, that towns in Ireland had corporations that reflected their people. That didn't happen in Derry, that didn't happen in Belfast, but Cork, Dublin, and uh, Limerick got taken up by the Catholic middle classes. And you go in a situation where the corporation is completely dominated by empire loyalists who will not give any permission with any nationalist memorial they nearly all after 1900. You see very, very few nationalist memorials that were permitted to be erected before in 1900. Um, the Catholic middle class of the Mercantilist interests take over uh, in league with the, empire, the Castle Catholics and the empire loyalists. They're all on the same page again. So this co-option of, of the stronger interest when it's safe to do so politically. Um, all, all the dangerous Presbyterians are driven out or go home and shut up. Uh, you, get, you get up to the 1890s and there's talk of you know, celebrating the centennial of 1798, Betsy Gray's memorial is destroyed by the Iron Order. Because they don't want nationalists going to pay tribute to a time when Tom was looking for the uni unity of Protestant Catholic in the centre as a Presbyterian community which we know at that point in time. They're vehemently sectarian, anti-ecumenical. Anti Look at the Paisleyites. Pa Ian Paisley found that Presbyterians weren't Presbyterian enough. 
And so he went off and made a super Presbyterian church, <laughs> and, and then a mega church. And he took note of what the evangelicals and Bob Jones were doing, and got Bob Jones posted with PhD. You know what I mean? Why not? Why not? While you're at it, there, you know, it, it's, it's remarkable, but it's contrived, exactly as Brendan says. And now you have this fault line, and the fault line emanates from Armagh. Now the Fermanagh militia at the time was was heavily armed, and there were there, some of them were killed in the city during '98, and many were killed in Wicklow where they deployed. Right, the Antrim militia predominantly composed of uh, Presbyterians under, under Church of Ireland officers, def 30 or 4 of them defected the Wicklow rebels when they were based in Wicklow. Because they were united Irishmen. Very, very relatively few Presbyterian yeomanry. From 1796 you had the sort of, you know, well-disposed citizens be brought in. Um, a lot of yeomanry were Catholic, but many of those units were reduced in 1797-98, including the Bray, Bray Cavalry, because they are fully united Irishmen. And the same thing is with many of the Presbyterian recruited uh, yeomanry, they were united Irishmen. The defenders, who, who were the counterweight to the plebeian people day boys and apple police, all those sort of intercommunal trouble which is stirred up, as exactly as Brandon said, by the, by the landlords, they go from being um, proto Jacobites to Jacobins after 1789, when they see the possibilities of, of, of cap state capture through a coup d'etat of the French Revolution. And if the biggest monarchy in Europe would fall, and with the biggest army in, in, uh, in Western Europe compromised by Republican ideals, that Ireland could be a republic. It was all to pay for. And the Presbyterians were all that, as did the right of the Protestants. In County Wicklow, the last thing I'll say, the United Irishmen, the top structure for security reasons was, was appointed from within a small country. So 15, 20, 30 people controlled the upper, upper echelons, which is never penetrated by the British. It's very effective. But the lower elements, um, through democratic forces, and charisma and ability were, were projected from below. So you've a captain of 120 men, a colonel of over, over 1,200 men, and then they would be, the adjutant generals for each county would be appointed by the national the <coughs> military directory. The military directory wasn't arrested in 1798 because no one knew who they were. Only the political leadership were arrested. They'd done their job, they'd written the pamphlets, they devised the ideology, people bought in and sworn in. Their job was done really on pending the successful revolution. But the military committee, which included Robert Emmett, right? And, and people, by his diagram of Grafton Street, people we'd never heard of, all of whom had seen service in the Continental Army and the American Army, they were very, very careful. And, and most of them survived, because men of them are still unknown to us. It's, it's quite a remarkable story. I was delighted to find some traces of this in the British archives and, and uh, show the importance of that. Um, in Wicklow, the one third church of Ireland, the county committee elected from below was one third church of Ireland. So when given a chance to vote in a way that mattered, because your voting people will lead you in battle, they, they, they did so on a non-sectarian basis. Mm. Because William Young of Banner Corps has been elected by Catholics. Because William Young of Banner Corps is a decent Republican, they liked him and respect him. This is over And Joseph Holt, the, great, the greatest fighting commander of the entire event, South Wicklow Protestant. So all this, all this sectarian bullshit we, we were, were forced to suffer, it, it wasn't us, it was them. Yeah. And they did it deliberately as a tactic. And it's a poisonous, horrendous thing that needs to be eradicated from our country. Mm. And it will be. Um, let's, let's one point I'd like to come back on. And I'm not coming back on, but just to throw into the mix as well. About the, the leaders of the United Irishmen. Now, I think there's very few people in, in, in this island who hasn't heard of Father Murphy. Uh, in the country of Oxford. But the Stan chief had actually heard the father of Quigley <laughs> from the county of Armagh. Uh, well, Quigley was the end of the West during that whole period of conflict uh, in the mid 90s to try and bring peace to the North Armagh area between meeting both sides. Talking to Catholics, talking to Protestants. It was in, it was a member of the United Irishman. Uh, he was then, Fiona's best said, between the defenders and what became the Orange Order, trying to stop that conflict, because he knew that the conflict was being provoked by those who were trying to do it for their own ends to, to secure the Union. He then was in England where he was working with the Society of United Englishmen, which many people don't actually know about, an organization. An organization <coughs> of 
from there he had then gone over and meeting with the main directory in France and with the United Irish movement about finalising the plans. He was then making his way back to Ireland when he was arrested in England. And he had a number of documents on him. He had been pinpointed by, I can't really remember the name, not more, but he was pinpointed by an informer who had actually been tracked him from France back to England, told the authorities. He said, that's him, he's got the documentation, but the documents if you just want. Uh, Father Cleary was hanged. He was tied, he was hanged at Maidstone Prison in Kent. You know, and as I say, you know, Father Murphy, everybody remembers. Father, Father, oh, really. probably because of the relationship that was being built between the Church of Art, uh, between the Catholic Church. I was remembered in the, in the 1790s. That the government started to finance families. And I would say that the first job that my niece was given after that grant was we, we need your clergy not to be involved in insurrection, but to but the, be working for loyalty, to maintain loyalty amongst your people, amongst the Catholic people. You know, and quickly I believe passed out of memory because the Catholic Church did not, did not want another rebel priest to appear or to be celebrated in the way that Father Murphy was, you know, because he, he, he was personally written out of all the histories. And yet, when you dig into that period of the United Irish Men, you see the role that he had within our body, you see the role that he had nationally, and you see the role that he had with the movement internationally, both in Britain with the, with the United Englishmen, the Senate of the United Englishmen, mm -hmm. and with the, with the leadership of the United Irishmen in France. He was, he was a, a main player, a bigger player than Father Murphy ever was down in the uh, action. Um, so everyone, uh, we are discuss discussing the United Irish Men, but I was hoping you could tell us a bit about the women involved in the movement at the time. Um, and let us know a little bit about Anne McCracken and Anne Devlin, but could you shed some light on the wider role of women in 1798? Well, actually, this is a difficult one, because um, just it, it was what it was, and we can't pretend it was any bit different. Women were not involved in mainstream politics. There's no woman elected and no woman in the vote. There were some women got the vote. Some women, married women over 30 got the vote in 1918. That's made a big difference. But they had to be basically married women over 30 could vote. And then a few years later, it became more emancipated. The United Irishmen didn't regard this as a big issue, and you didn't have a suffragist type uh, movement in the, in the 1790s, 1800s. Some people around them who were married into United Irish families, like Mary Wollstonecraft in England, who was a very interesting polemicist. She was arguing that women should have the vote, but she was a very, that, that was not a popular position even amongst women. Um, and that, I think that would have been taken up in due course, but it just, it just wasn't such a thing. There were no women in the United Irishmen, but there were women around them. Um, the um, the McTeer family, the Brennan McTeer family in Belfast and Dublin, uh, McCracken, and Marianne McCracken, very significantly, who lived into great age, and, and, and she definitely lived to a time where it was more propitious, and she was advocating those sorts of things. Her brother, not just Henry Joy, but I think Frank as well, all the members of the McCracken family were fighting field, fielded, you know, rebel leaders of, of considerable capacity. Um, the one who often gets mentioned around this time is the very deeply unfortunate Sarah Curran, but uh, she wasn't involved. I mean, she was the fiance of Robert Emmett and a figure of pathos and of romantic uh, romanticism, but not involved. In fact, because she didn't destroy the letter Robert wrote to her, wrote to her, the, the castle were able to figure out that Emmett was also known by different names from the handwriting comparison and that was a very significant in making sure he couldn't be reprieved. Now he's, he's full of hide up anyway, as I mean, mm -hmm. such a sissy issues. shoes. And Devlin, and Devlin's father and uncles were all in that Irishman, as were her brothers and her cousins. And they were very, very active all the way through the 1790s, in, in the Ockham area, South Great Cove, but also in West Great Cove, in the Mallow Valley, and Dublin City. Because what we, we tend to forget is, all those inner counties of Leinster would have their own neighbourhoods in Dublin, particularly in the Liberties. 
So in and around Francis Street, for instance, there was hundreds and hundreds of Wicklow Merchant United Irishmen lived in Francis Street, and around Francis Street. Right? And they were months of resource that were pulled, called upon by the, by the Directory in 18, July 1803, when they took half the city and held it for two or three hours, but it, where, where no one really noticed that they had. And then they went home. And when they when the first raid, they came to fight them. Two companies, one of the best regiments in the British Army, they beat them twice, beat them back into their barracks. People forget this, right? Have we declared the Republic with a very important document? They were, they're part of the discourse behind closed doors, definitely, because we can see that from their packments, from their tier, the ground correspondence. They're involved in these issues, but they're not going to be front and centre because there was no role for women in politics and they weren't allowed to vote. Okay, very much. Um, before I take some questions from the floor, I just wanted to ask you then, um, 2023 marks the 225th anniversary of the United Irishmen Rebellion. To us in Ireland, the United Irishmen, those initial ideas of the radical enlightenment, liberty of conscience, fraternity or community and equality mark the core tenets of our ideology, so much so we have them incorporated into our logo. What are the lessons for the movement today from that period? What can we learn? No, I, th I think a lot of the aims from that period still exist today and have been amplified, you know, whether you're talking what the aims of the United Irish men were. Right? Moving forward, uh, and those aims were taken up to another level by the ARB in the 1860s, where it was no longer uh, just about uniting Catholic Protestants in the centre, you know, bringing, adding that religious animosity that had been falsely created and bringing people together under a, a, a simple format. To the Fenians, who then made it very clear that it was also about the land and ownership of Ireland and the wealth of Ireland. And then move on to 1916 and, you know, the Connolly and others. Proclamation, yeah. The proclamation. And, you know, the fame, exactly what came of company they envisaged, and of what they want, that included all religions equally. Mm. That included that the wealth of the company would belong to the people of the nation, <coughs> not to multinational co companies, not to shell, not, not, not to domestic capitalists, you know. That, that there's a con almost a continuity and a development of every phase of the struggle that there's been, you know, from, from the 1780s through to the 1860s, through the 1916. Right up to the present time. The struggle has evolved. The aims of the struggle has evolved. But the basic aims have never changed that much. You know, it's still about the, the rights of ordinary people mm -hmm. above the, right, the rights oh, of you know, over, yeah. over any authority of the state. Mm -hmm. You know, that the state should be representing the views of its people. Yeah. Not the views of capitalism, not the views of multinationals, not the views of other countries or other power blocks. It should be <coughs> representing the views of people and acting in the best interests of the people of the country, mm. not acting in the best interests of the EU or NATO or whoever else. Mm. Yeah. Everyone, um, do you have any closing remarks you'd like to make as well? So I'll just, just simply say for one minute that I told you what Brendan said and he knows what he's talking about. If you, if you look at the, the inner cadres of all um, in, in incarnations of the public movement, go back for over 200 years, they were all highly conscious of the connectivity to the United Irishmen. And it, it, it's, it's codified, this is why why Wolf Tom? There's all the United Irishmen movement. Because we all the Thomas Russell and John Patrick, why the hell not? It's Tom, because that is the unifying point. And it's logical, it's coherent, it's identifiable, and it's convenient to some degree. To some degree. So I'm trying to get the bus to Salmons and I, you could do it. Are you with me? <laughs> they knew this. The 1803 Proclamation and the speech from, and the speech from the dock are quoted in the um, 1916 Proclamation. They're, they're directly quoted. As is allusion to the French Declaration of Rights of Man and also a quotation to the American Declaration of Independence. Right? 
when the Fenians recoalesced, uh, they all, they call, the other name they used themselves was, was United Brotherhood, mm. right? And, the, and they, they were revivification of Young Ireland, and Young Ireland was composed of former United Irishmen, including Holmes, the brother-in-law of Robert Emmett, who was a founding member of Young Ireland. You have a biological continuity, you have an ideological purity, and if it isn't broke, don't fix it. Um, I cannot think of any reason to improve on the ideology of the United Irishman other than to relate it to current affairs. But unfortunately, on top of achieving the political ideological objective is the reunification of the national territory. And that is something that's, that's, that's only now moving out of living memory, but it, it will get it back one day. Thanks very much.